Uh, right, so as Patrick said, I'm Donald McKinnon, I'm Chair of the SEF and a crofter from the Isle of Lewis. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit just now about really setting the context for the event today uh, and, and for the, the discussions we're going to have later on. I'm going to speak a little bit about the historical context and then move on to talking a bit about policy context and where things might be heading next. Um, as I go through the presentation, I'm going to be focusing a bit on Lewis, where I'm from, um, that will become a bit clearer when we get to the questions at the end when I'll be asking you to uh, think about your own area. So maybe you can be thinking about that as we go through the presentation. Um, so the historical context. So sometimes when you think about crofting, we can think about it as being something that's been around forever. And I think it's really important when we're having this discussion that we realise that it hasn't. That there's some ancient practices that, that are found in crofting but the system itself emerged in the 18th century. And, and that system was one that was centered around uh, the emergence of capitalism, really, in the Highlands and Islands. Um, taking a few different forms and different motivations by landlords at the time, uh, ultimately to maximize the value of their estates. Um, whether that was to organize um, what would have been historically uh, townships that were held runrig, um, with a taxman, like my own township in Arnold here on the west side of Lewis that you can see in the in photograph. Sorry, am I blocking oh, you here? Yes. Um, so you, you can see that uh, on the left hand side of the picture there, the sort of traditional to, to Lewis crofting township where uh, you have linear crofts that stretch for about half a mile down to the sea, which is um, to the left of the photo. Um, and you've also got these old black houses and uh, walled enclosures as well that, that kind of show how, how that township has changed over the, over the years. So that thing about what, why, did, why did landlords decide to start creating crofts in the first place is a really important one because uh, in it we, we have some answers for potentially for the future. One of, one of those other reasons was not just organising the estate but um, maintaining a population to do work, um, for example, in the kelp industry. Um, and then, of course, we have the, the other side of this, which was uh, that of clearance and um, the decision being taken that another land use would have been better for an area in the landlord's view and, and make more money for them. Um, it began with sheep and uh, later was more sporting, sporting estates. Um, and those people were sometimes moved to new crofting townships, of course. So uh, I think that, 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 that's important that we have that, we have that understanding and that we realise that this isn't something that has been around forever. It's something that was created relatively recently. Um, and like, like anything that is driven by the markets um, and that is based in, in, uh, in capitalism, it's often that uh, regulation is required, that if the market is allowed to decide everything, bad things tend to happen. We, we see that even today in, um, the, uh, around the gig economy. Every, every, every few weeks you'll hear a horrible story about Amazon and the practices there. Don't want to go too far into that, but, but it's just an example of, of where, you have, uh, where, 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 you, where, where something emerges like that and you don't have uh, control and regulation to, um, to, to mitigate against these bad effects of it. And uh, over, over time and through many, many injustices and um, the, the, the crofters war and um, um, crofters standing up and saying we, we, we need representation here, we need um, government to take action. Uh, the authorities did listen and the Napier Commission was uh, sent out around the Highlands and Islands to report on the state of crofting, um, reporting in 1883 and that is what ultimately, well, when they went around they, they found, they found bad things going on, they found that, uh, that crofters were um, that, 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 that crofters were not being treated well, that there were, there were many examples of injustices happening all across the crofting counties. Um, but they also found that crofters had ideas about what they wanted to see, that crofters wanted rights. And that's what ultimately led to the Crofting Act, uh, the 1886 Crofting Act, and then later the, the 1891, um, uh, forget the name of it, but the relating to common grazings, which is very important and sometimes uh, forgotten about as well. Um, so moving on to what happened next. So the 1886 Act gave crofters rights and it gave them responsibilities. And that changed 
the Highlands and Islands, um, and, and was, was a pretty radical piece of legislation. Um, it gave people the, the confidence to invest in, uh, in improvements on their land, and uh, gave them that security that they needed. But it still remained a precarious existence. You know, we, we have to be careful not to romanticise that and, and the way it was back then. This was a hard, hard way of life. Um, that's my granny and grandpa, they are uh, crofters from Arnold and Lewis. And um, they were both, they both grew up, both born in the 20, 1920s, so they were born within living memory of um, the, the people who had, who had probably given evidence to the Napier Commission. The, the system was very, very young when they were born. Um, and crofting has changed massively since then, uh, in terms of what, what it actually means in a practical sense and what, what happens on the ground. Um, but also in what it means to people, and th when they got their croft, they, they've, um, they got a croft quite late in life actually, uh, although they were both born in crofting uh, families for various reasons, but it, it, it transformed what, what they could do with their, um, with their lives going forward and, uh, and, and was a, a really, really big moment in their, in their lives. Um, so since the 1886 Act, there, there has been these various attempts to reform the law with varying degrees of success. Um, some, some really big changes, like in the, the 76 Act, which brought in the right to buy, um, and um, what, whatever you, you think about whether that was right or wrong, uh, it, it has led to a lot of the, the complications and the um, intricacies in the law that, that we're still trying to sort out to this day, and I'll come on to that later. But just going back to the Lewis example, what, what kind of happened in that period when my uh, granny and grandpa were, were growing up and, and eventually <coughs> crofting, uh, when they were born, they were born in black houses with fire in the middle of the floor and cows in one end of it. And the, 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 um, the crofting system then was totally based around milking cows and growing as much crops as you could on your croft for uh, feeding your family and feeding those cows with a few sheep as well. Um, but that gradually changed in Lewis to a situation where we moved away from growing stuff on the crofts, growing arable crops, to, and the cattle went in our township, there's been a few over the years, but there's no cows there today. And it's, uh, it's a system that's, that's now based on sheep in our area. Um, so, like I said, they are, uh, in, in, in my township and in most of Lewis, sheep are the dominant form of crofting. That's what people do with their land. Um, there's uh, some tree planting and in, in, increasingly people are getting more interested in this. Um, that plantation there is on our common grazing and it's a township plantation that was uh, done in the 90s uh, and that's my, my sheep heading out onto the, the open moor. Um, but common grazings have actually, the, the use of common grazings has declined as well as sheep numbers have declined too. So although that's the dominant form of crofting, um, we, we've, we've, seen, we've seen changes there too and talk a bit about that later as well. Um, increasing interest in horticulture and growing. Um, a drive around the highlands and you see plenty of polycrops springing up all over the place, um, certainly a, a, with us anyway, and a lot more interest in growing your own. Um, but there's, a, there's another side to this as well, and while when my granny and grandpa got, got their croft, that was, you know, you couldn't imagine crofts being unworked at that time. But, but now we're seeing crofts being unworked, uh, underused as well, I would say as well. Um, and increasingly multiple crofts being worked by, by a single crofter. And uh, that's me, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not here to say that that's, that's not something that happens and, and I, I tend a croft, I'm a, a subtenant of another croft, but I also use a few others uh, in, on an informal basis. And that's very, very common, in, uh, certainly with us and I would imagine across the crofting counties as well. Um, but that has some policy implications which we might come on to later as well. And like I said, they're less use of the common grazings. Um, so what is that policy context? So all of those things that I talked about there, about the changes in uh, what people have done with the land, there's been some, some there's, there's, the world has changed, there's been social changes, but, uh, but a, lot of that, um, a lot of that change in actual activity, uh, it can be linked to policy. And, and one of the most important areas of policy for what we're talking about is, is agriculture and how agriculture has been supported in various different ways and what the priorities have been for that support. Um, so that's, that's what um, led to, a, it could be argued anyway, that led to a 
decline in cropping activities on crops on crofts um, due to the way support was delivered to them. It also uh, incentivised a, a massive increase in the number of uh, sheep being kept in, in a lot of areas as well um, through the, the, the 80s, 90s until uh, when payments were coupled and um, were based on a headage payment and that, that only started to decline uh, into the, the, the early 2000s, well late 90s, early 2000s when decoupling started to take place. So we, we can't talk about crofting without talking about agricultural policy and, and how that has impacted us. And, um, and, and what we can actually do with agricultural policy is make changes that will benefit crofting too. So you'll all be aware that we're going through a process of um, reform of the agricultural policy at the moment. There's a, the agriculture bill is out for consultation just now, um, but the, the agricultural bill is very important and we'll be putting in a response to that. Um, but what we see in that is, is, is largely framework legislation, um, but it's the policy that comes after that that is going to be really key for, uh, for crofting and, and for crofters and for what we can actually, um, what, what we can see the system deliver in the future. So getting our priorities right around that and linking that back in with what we're actually seeing on the ground in, in various different parts of the crofting counties is, is key and linking that back into what we actually want to see delivered. So the next two points there, net zero and biodiversity, these are intrinsically linked with the uh, agricultural policy and with the agriculture bill because these two, these two issues, net zero and the climate emergency and, and the biodiversity crisis, these, these, are what are, what, these two things are driving the agriculture policy and driving government's um, uh, thinking on it. And uh, we have very clear targets that have been set around both of these. Um, and the agriculture bill and the agriculture policy are going to have to deliver to meet those uh, targets for government. Um, so how these fit into crofting are, is, is really key. On the net zero one, um, there's a sort of side issue, I suppose, a sort of side issue, it, it's, it's, it's probably the, the, the major one that we're all familiar with, is where ruminant livestock fit into that. And um, what, what's happened here is that we have quite a uh, vociferous at times agenda against uh, red meat, which is, you know, that there is a basis of science in that, but what has happened is that the debate and the way that the debate has been uh, carried out um, ha has alienated red meat producers and has turned off a lot of crofters from engaging with that. And, and that's a real problem because if that's what everybody is talking about and, um, and, and we feel threatened by it, um, we, we need to engage in that debate and we need to make our arguments clear about why it is actually okay to keep on producing sheep and cattle in the way that we do. Um, and still acknowledging that reducing our emissions can be part of that and that we can do that more efficiently. Um, on biodiversity we have another controversial topic as well that I'll bring in um, around uh, the concept of rewilding and again what has happened with that debate is that it has become polarised. It's become a debate where crofters feel uh, threatened by that word, rewilding. When in actual fact, if uh, proponents of it had been a bit um, cleverer, I suppose, maybe that's not the right word, but anyway, you can think about it, think, come up with something else, but uh, about how they approach that, then they would actually have found that crofters were pro could probably have been the biggest allies in, that, um, in, in what, achieving what they, the outcomes that they actually want to see. And that's what this has to be about. It's got to be about outcomes. It's got to be about what we actually want to see happen and, and linking that back in with what government wants to see too. Um, but how that's going to work in a crofting context, that's going to come from the people in this room and what, how, how we know that these policy areas will interact with crofters <coughs> on the ground with crofters in, in townships across the Highlands and Islands. Um, next point around population retention is a really important one too. And I think it's fair to say that in this area, it's, it's probably actually local authorities, um, and certainly in our area, um, but it, through the Convention of the Highlands and Islands and other examples like that, um, it's, 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 the, it's these bodies that are leading on that debate around um, making the case for why we need to, what the crisis is that we're approaching in population in the Highlands and Islands. But, but making the case for why that's important that we deal with it. Um, I think government's probably lagging behind a wee bit there. Um, I think some of the 
we had the Islands Bill um, and um, the work that's that's been led forward by the, the Islands team, but, but no real concrete policies on how we actually address this population uh, retention issue. Um, but Crofting has some answers there. Going back to why some of these landlords decided to create it in the first place, to, to, uh, to keep people on their estates to provide a workforce, um, that may not have been... Um, you know that 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 was obviously a, a sort of manipulative way of of um, of dealing with people, but by the same principle, if crofting legislation is done in the correct way, and it, and if we look at the opportunities there, we can we can achieve the same outcomes. Gaelic as well is is to, is very closely linked to that population retention issue. Um, we have some of the strongest Gaelic speaking communities are also crofting communities, and the, the two are very very closely linked. Um, and if we get if we get crofting policy right, we can we can also support the Gaelic language and our culture and and the the, the important links between uh, Gaelic and crofting. <coughs> so, um, I, I won't dwell too much on the, the next two. Um, again, we've got cr crofting law reform process happening at the moment. Uh, there should be a bill in this parliamentary session, um, but that's where I think the discussion that we're going to have uh, when when you uh, answer some of my questions. I want you to have these things in mind, that we do have a crofting law reform process coming along. If, if people do have ideas and suggestions for what should be included in that, the, the door still isn't closed on that, I don't think. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's really important that we, we join up what we want to see from crofting in the future with what uh, the legislation actually says. Crofting legislation only exists to serve crofters and crofting, and if it's not, then we need to change it. Um, we've got a land reform bill coming up as well. The consultation just finished on that, and I think there's also some good uh, opportunities to include crofting in that. We've been arguing uh, in particular about the creation of new crofts and uh, how that links in with the, the policy. Um, okay, that takes me on to my questions. So, um, as I said at the start, I, I kind of focused a bit on Lewis there and how, how crofting has uh, emerged in Lewis and and, uh, and where it ended up. But I want you to possibly critique that if you don't agree with what I said, but also on your tables to think about what is the situation in your area and what has contributed to it. So you're not in geographical areas on your tables, so there's going to be a bit of uh, discussion on what area you're going to focus on. Um, but uh, I'll leave that up to you to decide. We're, we'll have a few multiples. And if you don't want to focus on a specific area, you can take that question quite broadly and just think about what is the situation with, uh, with crofting and, um, and what has contributed to that. So is it agricultural policy that has led to a certain set of circumstances being in an area? Is it uh, crofting law? Is it something else? Is it something totally outside the scope of what I've discussed today so far? Um, uh, I, I would quite like you to, I, I'm, although I'm probably not, I would quite like you to focus on specific areas because th the reason I'm saying this is because crofting is so diverse, you know, that, that we have so many different uh, experiences of it around the Highlands and Islands and I really want to try and capture that in this uh, discussion today. And then we're, we're going to answer that question first and then the second question is on what opportunities does the policy context offer crofting? So, kind of following on from what we identify as being the, the potential problems, or maybe there are problems in some areas, maybe it's all going very well, but what are the opportunities that the policy context offer crofting and all these, all these different uh, pieces of legislation that are coming up, or things that, um, policy areas that people are thinking about, how could crofting benefit from those, and how could they be achieved in practice? So is it legislation? Is it better support um, <coughs> through the agricultural support system or is it something completely different? So I think any questions, is that right Patrick? And then... Just for clarity. Just for clarity, yeah. Yeah, questions for clarity and then we'll, uh, you'll discuss it in your groups. <coughs> 